Welcome everyone to episode 16 of Ohio Unsolved. I'm your host Matthew, and in today's episode, we hear about the still unknown Ohio serial killer nicknamed Dr. No. We also have another listener story, so please keep sending your stories in if you'd like for them to be read in a future episode. Now let's just get right into the stories. Make sure to lock those doors and windows and get ready for Ohio Unsolved. Between 1981 and 2004, Ohio had a serial killer known as Dr. No, or the Ohio Prostitute Killer. He's thought to be responsible for the murder of at least nine women up and down I-71 in Ohio. He would choose prostitutes in parking lots and truck stops. There are suspicions that he killed three other women in New York, Pennsylvania, and Illinois. Most of the victims were sex workers at the Union 76 truck stop east of Akron and west of Youngstown, Ohio. Because of this, the police began to suspect that he was a truck driver. Most of the victims were found without their shoes and underwear. The killings began when the body of a young woman was found in Miami County on April 24, 1981. The cause of death was determined to be strangulation and a severe head injury. The young woman had no personal belongings or any kind of identification on her, which made it extremely difficult to identify her. According to the police, she was well groomed and there was no sign of sexual assault and the police did not classify her as a sex worker. At the time, she was nicknamed Buckskin Girl because she was found wearing a buckskin poncho. She was finally identified as Marsha King in 2018. The next victim found was 25-year-old Marsha Matthews. She was found by a trucker one mile from the Union 76 truck stop, badly beaten but barely alive, on June 16, 1985. She died just two days later due to a traumatic brain injury that she sustained after a severe beating with a blunt object. The third victim, a 23-year-old prostitute named Shirley Dean Taylor, was found brutally beaten and strangled to death. She was spotted at the Union 76 truck stop shortly before her disappearance. According to witnesses, she was going to meet a regular client nicknamed Dr. No whose identity was never established by police. Her body was found a few miles from the truck stop with her shoes and underwear missing. In December 1986, the next girl was found. 18-year-old April Barnett went missing from the Union 76 truck stop and her body was found just a few days later, 70 miles from Austin town. Just like the others, she was beaten and strangled, and some of her clothing was taken from her. A few days later, 18-year-old prostitute Jill Allen was found murdered near I-70 in Illinois. The police considered her a victim of the same killer, even though she was found in another state. She was murdered in the same way as the others, beaten and strangled to death. She also was missing her bra, underwear, and her shoes. Anne Marie Patterson was the next young girl to go missing on February 7, 1987. 
Her body was found 40 days later, 250 miles from where she went missing, near Cincinnati. A week before she disappeared, she had been arrested and also gave information about another murder victim and described the suspect's car. She told police that she had made an appointment with the unknown man over a CB radio and that his nickname was Dr. No. She also told the police that this man was extremely negative. From this, the police and the media began using the nickname Dr. No when discussing the murders. On August 10, 1987, another young girl was found in Inglewood, Ohio. When the police arrived on the scene, they found her lying in the grass, her shirt and bra missing, and her pants and underwear were down around her ankles. According to the forensic team, the killer threw her body from his car as he drove past. After the autopsy, they were able to determine that she was between 20 and 25 years old. Despite her being covered in tattoos, she wasn't able to be identified until 2010. Thanks to her photos being included in the National Missing and Unidentified Persons database, her family finally found out what happened to her. She was 21-year-old Paula Beverly Davis. Even though she was included in the task force dedicated to the murders, other theories were discussed either a drug dealer's retaliation or an unrelated serial killer. On November 22, 1987, LaMonica Cole's body was found near a truck stop in Breezewood, Pennsylvania. Despite being found in another state and off a different highway, she was included as a potential victim because she was murdered in a similar way and she was a native of Ohio. Some of her clothing was taken as well. During the investigation, her pimp, 24-year-old Derek Mims, told the police that on the day that she went missing, she left in a blue semi-truck with white stripes. March 29, 1988, 31-year-old Terry Rourke was murdered in New York. Her body was found on one of the bridges that cross over the Mohawk River. She died from a traumatic brain injury and suffered from a brutal beating only hours before her body was found. Some of her clothes, including her underwear and shoes, were never found, leading the police to believe that she was yet another victim of the notorious Dr. No. On April 19, 1990, another female's body was found near a truck stop on the I-70. Most of her clothes were missing, however, her panties remained. An autopsy concluded that she had died from a traumatic brain injury resulting from a beating and she had had sexual intercourse 12 to 24 hours before her death. With these conclusions, the investigators suggested that the victim was a prostitute and had fallen victim to the serial killer. Despite multiple attempts to identify her, she remained unidentified with the placeholder name Jane Doe II until her identification as 29-year-old Patrice Anita Corley in 2017. Over the course of the entire investigation, the police interviewed hundreds of pimps, prostitutes, truck stop employees, and truck drivers, hoping that just one of them could identify the killer. According to witnesses, the killer appeared to be a rather large, tall man, ranging in age from 25 to 40 years old. He wore glasses and spoke with an accent that's from one of the northeastern states. The vehicle that he was seen in was a silver truck with a red hood. The Ohio State Police, along with hundreds of volunteers, posted over 4,000 photos of the victims and an identikit of the killer at hundreds of truck stops, rest areas, and service stations all over Ohio and nine other states with a similar highway structure. They offered a $10,000 reward for information about him. From all of this, five people were detained, who all at some point were nicknamed Dr. No but no charges were ever filed 
and none of their names were ever disclosed to the public. In April 1991, a resident of Lake County, Ohio, 36-year-old Alvin Wilson became a suspect. Wilson, who worked as a trucker and owned two tractors, was among those whose hair samples matched those found on some of the victims. Credit card receipts and other evidence indicated his possible responsibility for the Ohio murders. In 1990, he was arrested on charges of assault and attempted murder of a woman in October 1989. After his arrest, the girl contacted police, stating that in 1986, Wilson had picked her up in Akron after paying for her services, and had, he had beat and attempted to strangle her afterward. Wilson was tested for any involvement, but the results were inconclusive. That same year, a long-haul trucker named John Fautenberry was arrested for several murders committed across four states. He was briefly considered a suspect in the killings, but was later ruled out as his victim profile was just too different. Then, in June 1994, a 36-year-old trucker from Ohio, James Robert Cruz Jr., was convicted in the March 1993 murder of 17-year-old Don Marie Birnbaum in Center County, Pennsylvania whose body was found along Interstate 80. The girl's body was discovered a few days after her death. Since most of her clothes were missing, Cruz was considered a possible suspect in the Ohio killings. He was tested, but subsequently no charges were filed against him concerning the other murders. In 1995, 28-year-old Sean Patrick Goble, a trucker from North Carolina, who had admitted to killing two prostitutes in Tennessee in April of that year, was among the many suspects for the murder of a North Carolina woman in early 1995. As a trucker, Goebel traveled to several dozen states across the country, where cases of disappearances and murders of prostitutes along interstate highways were recorded. Following his arrest, Goebel was investigated for murders in at least 10 states. Nevertheless, he was cleared of any suspicion of being the elusive Dr. No, since at the time of the first murder in 1981, he was still in high school, and in the mid-1980s, when the majority of the killings took place, he was serving in the army and was stationed outside of Ohio. In November 2005, on the basis of DNA profiling, authorities arrested 46-year-old Delmas Colvin, a truck driver who killed five prostitutes in Toledo. Colvin later admitted to killing at least two others in New Jersey, but adamantly denied any involvement in the Dr. No murders during the 1980s. In early 2019, 49-year-old Samuel Legg was arrested in Arizona. Using DNA profiling, law enforcement agencies were able to prove his guilt in four murders in Ohio and Illinois, the first of which he committed at age 20 in 1989. His initial arrest was due to a match for an unsolved 1997 rape of a minor in Medina County, Ohio where he was extradited to stand trial. In the fall of 1990, Legg was a suspect in the murder of his stepdaughter, 14-year-old Angela Hicks, in El Raya, but as there was not enough evidence, he was not charged. I'm gonna break away from the script for just a moment. I'm now seeing on other websites that Samuel Legg has been arrested as the Dr. No serial killer and as soon as I find more information, I will update in another episode. Now back to the script. It amazes me how so many people are able to kill people for years and never get caught. To this day, no one knows who the mysterious Dr. No is, or is it Samuel Legg? Is he still alive? Is he still killing in Ohio, or maybe in a different state? 
I'd like to one day hear that they finally figure out who this is and hold them accountable for all the pain and suffering they've caused the friends and family of all his victims. My next story is another listener story sent to me from Tessa Yarger and her husband. Now they live in Ohio, but their story takes place in Gettysburg, which is known to be one of the most haunted places in the United States. So let's just get on with the story. My husband is from Pennsylvania, born and raised, and I have never been to Gettysburg before, and I am super interested in ghosts and the paranormal. So what better place to go? He takes me, but he is mostly a non-believer in the paranormal. We tour Gettysburg on our own, but before we leave there was a walk-along ghost tour. We decided to go for the walk just for fun. The tour guide is walking us along, telling us ghost stories of different buildings and such. When we reach the end of the tour, the guide says that if we don't believe in such activity, there is a lesser known battlefield, which I can't remember the name of, that during the battle there was a farmhouse that a soldier had been visiting the owners of. The enemy had learned of this soldier and came in and murdered the family and soldier. Rumor has it, there was fog that rolled out and chased the enemy away. The guide says, if you go out to this field and just sit for about 15 to 20 minutes, most people start to get an eerie feeling like someone is watching them and they have to leave. They can't handle the feeling. So he challenged anyone interested to go out and try to just sit and see if anything happens. We left the tour and walked through Gettysburg National Cemetery. I took a lot of pictures trying to capture anything without success. We eventually leave and I drive us straight out to this field. Now at this point, I'm kind of disappointed because I've been interested in the paranormal for a very long time and have not had an experience in one of the most active places. We arrive at this field And as we drive down this half-paved, half-dirt road, it was very quiet and kind of eerie. On our right side was a forest, and on the left side, the field with cannons lining the roadway. We pull over to the right along the tree line. My husband sees a tree that has been struck by lightning and split down the middle and decides he wants to see if there's any bullets embedded in it. We get out and walk. He inspects the tree, and I look at the cannons, and eventually we get back in the car. We sit in silence for about 15 minutes or so, and decide to leave because nothing is happening. As I start to pull off, my husband notices something just inside the tree line. He tells me it looks like a firefly, but it's red. I see nothing. Eventually. He doesn't see it any, anymore, and I start to leave again. As I'm starting to pull away, I'm searching the tree line, and now I see it. I tell him, and I describe it to him, and we both agree that we have seen the same thing. So now I'm pulled over again, and he has his passenger window down. We are sitting there in silence when we hear something that sounds like someone walking around inside the tree line. This tree line is approximately 10 to 12 feet away from us. At first, we think maybe it's an animal, and my husband yells out the window to try and scare it away, but it continues. He then opens his car door and slams it shut. The noise continues. His son calls him on Facebook Messenger to do a video call. They are talking, and as they're speaking, this noise of footsteps continues. At the time, it sounds like it's rushing towards us. In times, it sounds like it's inside the tree line. Now my phone rings, and it's my mother. As we are talking, I am telling her what's going on, when all of a sudden, My husband's video call with his son suddenly turns strange. His son sounds like he is in another room, but we can see him on the screen. Then 
it cuts out in its pure white noise. But his son is still visible and moving on the screen. The white noise lasts for about 10 seconds when all of a sudden a voice comes through the white noise and says, get out. Needless to say, I dropped my car in the drive and drove off. Now, I didn't just creep away at the posted speed limit, but I sped away. As we were driving away from the spot, a fog was rolling in behind us. The way the fog moved, it was as if it was chasing us away. The road away from this area into the stop sign was approximately two miles. We made it to that stop sign in under a minute. We came to a stop and realized we were both still on the phone. I spoke with my mom and she had heard everything that had just happened. She heard the white noise, she heard the voice, she had heard it all. My husband's son had also heard it, which was really strange because the noise came through my husband's phone. We both ended our phone calls and decided to turn around and go back. When I turned around, the fog was gone and the road back to the spot was a clear one. We headed back to the spot and the actual drive back lasted about two minutes. When we arrived, everything had settled down. The steps were no longer there, the crickets were chirping and evening was settling in. We sat in silence for another 20 minutes, but nothing happened again. Now that was a creepy story. I've read this story a few times, and every time I read it, I get goosebumps. I've been to Gettysburg once in my life, and from what I remember, it was a lot of fun. We even did a nighttime ghost tour, but I wasn't lucky enough to see anything myself. Thank you so much for sharing your story with us, and please, if you have any more, don't hesitate to send them over. These listener stories don't necessarily have to be from Ohio or take place in Ohio. I just want to help get your story out to the world. Well, that's going to do it for this week's episode. If you enjoyed this podcast, please rate and review on Apple and Spotify. A five-star rating really goes a long way to helping other people discover this podcast. Also, make sure to share with any friends and family that enjoy this kind of content. If you would like to help support the show, please consider subscribing on Patreon. There are three tiers to choose from, each with their own perks. I just released the second bonus episode on there. I will also be heading out to my first location for the Patreon-only videos, and I'm hoping for that to be up by the end of the month. Thank you all for listening, and make sure to keep those doors and windows locked, and stay ready for Ohio Unsolved.